There is no minimalist rule book. Well, until now, the minimalists have created 16 rules for living with less, a free ebook which you can download right now at theminimalists.com/resources. Enjoy. The minimalists. <laughs> Hello everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist podcast where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn and I'm Ryan Nicodemus and together we are the Minimalists. Today we're going to talk about consumerism. We're going to talk about the successes and failures of modern society. We're going to talk about the price of progress and we're going to talk about whether civilization has actually made us less civilized and we're going to do all of that with today's guest dr christopher ryan is here chris ryan author uh, well let me say author of a couple books but this new book let me just say something about your new book chris by the way thank you for being here it's, yeah. it's a pleasure can't <laughs> wait to hear what you're gonna say welcome thanks so, yeah thanks so, for being so with us. chris's new book is called <clears throat> civilized to death which isn't just a great title there are maybe six books that i wish i would have written <laughs> And this is definitely on that list of six. Oh, wow. Um, what are the other five? <laughs> uh, freedom. Fifty Shades of Grey. No. Yeah. Freedom by Jonathan <laughs> Tw- Franz Twilight. was up there. Uh, um, nice. There, there, there are, you know, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance was, is, mm. um, is amazing. There are just a few books that I, I, I really wish, like oh, The Circle by Dave Eggers is mm-hmm. another one, um, that I wish... I would have written because like you communicate in this book, Civilized to Death, and we'll talk more about the book. I just wanted to give you a compliment at the top. Thank you. Encourage people to check out Civilized to Death. It just yeah. came out. It's really great. I own three copies. In fact, I don't even, here, I'm gonna hold up Jordan, I'm gonna hold up a copy of our book, Minimalism, and you're gonna superimpose on the YouTube video. Because <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing of technology. Yeah. So this, this is this is Chris's book right here. I'm sure there'll be a, an image. It has a great cover. I don't have my copy here because my wife stole my copy. Although I have three copies. It's funny, I, Mariah stole my copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have three copies. I have the ebook copy on 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 my Kindle app. Mm-hmm. I've got the audiobook version. Uh, because you also have a podcast (laughs) right tangentially speaking yeah and i was talking to my doctor my doctor listens to your podcast really (laughs) yeah uh he's he's great um uh chris kelly and uh we we were talking about it and you have some really fascinating guests on your podcast from all walks of life you just stumble across random people at a bar or in some random town in montana and you're like hey do you want to be on my podcast and you're able to like carry the conversation on, but here's the but I have. Uh, my doctor and I both agreed on this. He, in fact, he's the one who brought it up. He goes, Chris's podcast is the one podcast where I want to hear less of the guests, and I just want to hear more oh, of Chris Ryan. <laughs> I feel the opposite. I, I, in fact, the episode I just put up yesterday, I, I apologize for talking too much. Because when I was doing the mix, I saw like my track, it's just like, I'm like, come on, I let the guest talk, you know? No, um, but great, thank man. you for saying that. But I uh, well, you I, do these these Roma episodes. Yeah, th- those are to get it out of my system. Yeah. And they're they're so good, man. And so I'm going to do my best today to shut up as much as possible. I would encourage folks to check out Civilized to Death. Check out Chris Ryan's podcast. Let's dive into some of these questions right away. Our first question is from Christy in St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, my name is Christy. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I was just at work reading a bunch of articles about Amazon's new products that they're releasing, like the Echo Microwave and um, Alexa in your car and everything, and it is just mind-blowing to me that our society has become lazy enough to where we don't even want to press buttons to cook a potato. We have to have a voice um, to cook our potatoes. So I was wondering what your guys' thoughts on that is, because to me it's mind-blowing and everybody seems super excited about it, but I just can't believe this is where we came as a society. Alexa, kill Ryan Nicodemus. <laughs> <laughs> Calling Ryan Nicodemus. <laughs> uh, Chris, what do you think? I mean, it, it, some of these advances aren't really advances, even though they report to be. Yeah. In fact, a lot of them are going in the wrong direction. Yesterday, I told my phone, I won't say the words because it would trigger everybody's phones, <laughs> uh, take me to Trader Joe's and it called Joe Rogan instead. Oh. <laughs> like, Sorry, Joe. <laughs> uh, hey, Joe, you know how to get to Trader Joe's from here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, no, like so, so many of these things are sold to us as advances. They're going to make life more convenient. They're going to make life better. But as we find again and again and again, it goes the opposite direction, mm, right? Yeah. Uh, I remember, you guys probably aren't old enough, but I remember when the internet started. I remember the first cell phones, you know? I saw some guy with a holster walking down the street with his we cell phone. We sold the first cell phones. Oh. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Those we, were the coolest guys, Back in the, the 90s. Way. Oh, with the phones cool. on their heads, Super man. Cool guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like all these things are supposed to make life better. Yeah. Have they? Easier. Have they? Yeah. Nice. We, Simpler. We have so much free time now, don't we? Right. right. Everybody's just lying around in hammocks with all that time that these conveniences <laughs> have brought about. Well, you talk about that in the book, too. You you talk about uh, who, who's the guy who had the theory that once technology gets us to a certain point, we, we we're only going to have to work 15 hours a week or 20 hours a week. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I forget the author, a well-known author that I quoted there. Um, that was like 100 years ago. He was looking into the future and how great everything's going to be. But, but in fact, what happens is these technological advances could be used to make us work to allow us to work less and to spread resources more equitably Mm -hmm. but in fact they keep being employed to uh, increase productivity right uh, thereby reducing the value of labor right so when you look at these statistics saying you know the u.s worker is five times more productive than than 10 years ago yeah, but he's not being paid five times as much, right? Right. So yeah. what they're doing is they're they're putting these robots in, and you know, uh, more technological uh, assist in the manufacturing process, and they're firing people. Mm-hmm. So we mm-hmm. see on a global scale how this works. It's not helping people, mm-hmm. and we see on a personal level how it works as well. I can't talk on my damn cell phone. I can't hear the person. I remember when phones had cords attached to them, and you could hear the person <laughs> on the other side. Even when you do radio interviews now, they're like, can you use a landline phone? And yeah, I'm like, right. wait, wait, what is that? How am I going to find a landline phone? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, we did an experiment. We do these uh, screenless Saturdays from time to time where we just put our phone in a drawer. Uh, try to find a payphone now. It's virtually impossible, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and so, yes, we have progressed. And some of these, uh, so you're not. Uh, there's a misconception here. You're not anti-progress, but I think the thesis of your book, if there is one, is that many of the ways that we are progressing are, are not aiding our our happiness, our joy, our satisfaction, our fulfillment. In fact, they're getting in the way of it. So, yes, I mean, some technological advances. Yeah, if you're going to cook your potato, it's probably better to have an oven or maybe even a microwave than it is to, like, try to figure out how to start a fire with a piece of flint. Right. So for us, like, there is a, a level of technology that is helpful but then there is a level of technology that does make us um a bit complacent yeah and and reliant on the technology in a way that actually disconnects us from our humanity yeah i mean if these things were invented for like people with disabilities i think that's great like the voice activated thing alexa is great for you know people who who that really truly adds value to their life but i feel like yes this is these types of inventions are leading us towards that wally scenario where we're like sitting in the chair and everything is just kind of given to us and yeah it totally creates complacency yeah in, in the book in civilized to death i tell a story about the greatest shower i ever took yeah uh, it was in nepal and i'll never forget it i'd been trekking for a couple of days i was sweaty i uh way up in the mountains and and i got to this little village and uh, it was a situation, there were no showers, and so there's a little fire, and I put the pot, like a spaghetti pot, on the fire, and I filled it up with water, and then once the water was hot, it took 45 minutes or something to get that water hot, mm-hmm. and then I put it in a bucket, and I added enough cold water that the temperature was just right, and I sort of sponged my pits, and you know, did all this, and then there was this moment at the end where I just poured it over my head, and man, I almost had an orgasm. It was like, <laughs> oh my God, that's yeah. so good. Yeah. And like this morning, I stepped into the shower, you know, turned the lever, stood there, thought about something else for a while, mm-hmm. turned it off, n- took no pleasure in it. Right. right. And so when we look at the value of life and the meaning of life and, and trying to judge whether life is better or worse, one of the things that we need to look at is how much pleasure is in your life, right? Mm. And how much stress, how much anxiety. And man, you know, I think the problem with these sorts of conversations around whether life is getting better or not, and what is progress, and what's the price of progress, we have to figure out what we're measuring, 
Yeah. Right. If we're measuring convenience, there's no doubt a voice activated microwave is super convenient. Mm -hmm. But how much pleasure does it bring into your life? Right. Uh, where are you after that thing enters your life versus where you were before? I personally take a lot of pleasure from cooking. I love to spend an afternoon cooking. Yeah. I love the you know to simmer soup on a winter <laughs> afternoon or bake some bread. I'm sh I'm sure there are machines that'll do that for me, but mm -hmm. then what am I going to do? Yeah. Work? It's inter interesting like this balance we have to find between like because if you have just all pleasure, then life is miserable. If you have no pleasure, life is miserable. But like to use your shower as an example, it's Wait, like life is miserable with all pleasure. No, absolutely. Oh yeah. If, if, if it's a hundred percent pleasure, I want to try that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll, t I'll I mean, tell you what. Go you wrote buy about some. The Go buy some heroin off the street. Oh. And heroin will give you pleasure. You yeah, aren't people buying heroin to to mask the pain. They might be, but yeah. But I, I think they're using pleasure to mask the pain, though. Mm. Same thing with a sex addict. Right. So um, go out and you know having sex is great. Having sex every five minutes for you know a week straight that's going to it's going to wear on you. Yeah. I mean, you write about that <laughs> literally. Uh, whenever <laughs> you write about that in the book, that whenever we have more than enough, it's always too much. Mm. And, yeah, right. and and the there's a line you have about the Rolex which I love. I wrote this down. A watch tells the time. A twenty thousand dollar Rolex tells people you've got issues. Mm. And and that that's so true. We have an essay on our website uh, about a Rolex won't buy you more time. And yet, even mm. as one of the minimalists, I am still tantalized by a Rolex advertisement. Sure. I feel as sure. though like, well, maybe it's going to help me. Uh, signal that I'm a better person to other people, and it, it will it'll make me a more complete or better version of myself. And I think that's with any of these technologies that we get really caught up in. The object of our desire, like this voice-activated microwave, as soon as that voice-activated thing stops working, it now becomes the object of our discontent. Right. Where mm -hmm. all of a sudden Siri this morning is telling you the calling Joe Rogan, and it's like, well, wait a minute, like. Now you're pissed off at your the thing that before was bringing the absolute convenience to you because, as you write about in the book, the hedonic treadmill, we adapt to virtually anything that we bring into our lives. That's why there are so many highly wealthy people that are just miserable because they're so used to getting everything they want. And and the shower, their their gold shower stops working for them for five minutes, and mm. they're really they don't know yeah. how to function. But when you go without a shower, shower? <laughs> <laughs> not golden shower. <laughs> but when you go without a shower for however long, and yeah. then you're in the middle of nowhere, and you could just barely get some warm water, yeah. it makes that shower so pleasurable. Yeah, well, it's like food; you're gonna appreciate it more if you're hungry. Yeah, and and because of this this world of of this artificially created abundance, we never allow ourselves to get hungry. Yeah. Never allow ourselves to you know get uncomfortable in any way right. um you know I, I wrote about how in my own life you know i've seen these things happen right like i used to travel with very little money uh backpacking around the world staying in guest houses and sleeping in you know kind of iffy beds in <laughs> cheap places in <laughs> india and all that and yeah it wasn't super comfortable but i met really interesting people mm -hmm. and then i i won in particular i remember is my birthday and like uh, i must have been 25 26 i decided to splurge and get a nice room at a big hotel in cancun on my birthday and I went up to the room and watched CNN and the windows wouldn't open and it, it was air conditioned. And then mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll go down to the pool. That'll be cool. And I went to the pool and it was all these fat businessmen floating around. <laughs> and it's like, uh, there's nobody here yeah. that I want to talk to. This, this is splurging. Yeah. Man. I just bought myself into misery is what I did. And I see people doing that with their lives, right? Yeah. I, I wrote about rich asshole syndrome in the book, sort of mm -hmm. tongue in cheek, a new psychological problem. But what I wanted to do in that chapter was something I, I think is pretty important, which is talk about how being wealthy can make people so unhappy. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they just don't appreciate what they have. It's that having more than the people around you separates you. Yes. And separation is painful for us. Yeah. Whether you're separated because you're in prison or in solitary confinement or you're excluded from the group for some other reason, wealth separates you from your mm. tribe, mm -hmm. right? And even if you're part of the tribe down at the golf course or you know the yacht marina, those are all very separate people because they're all suspicious, 
you know, very wealthy people. They're suspicious. Why, why do you want to hang out with me? What's your angle? What are you trying to get? Do you actually like me or you just want the money? You want access to this stuff. It, it's very toxic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, too much money, too much fame, too much power. All of these things are toxic. Yeah. And, and you talk about in the book about how a lot of rich people, as they get rich, they actually give less mm. than when they made less money. Right. And, and I, I'm th- I think of this, uh, I think the stat, and I, Sean, maybe correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, but uh, the stat is South Dakota has roughly the same population as San Francisco metro area. Um, obviously, the a number of billionaires is much higher in San Francisco, but South Dakota gives to charity four times as much as the people really? in San Francisco, right. and, and it's exactly what you're talking about. There, there are compassionate middle class or even poor people who have found a way to to contribute beyond themselves in a meaningful way. But as you acquire more wealth, now in the book you even acknowledge like there are some people who are able to get past that. There are some compassionate billionaires, sure. but they're more sure. the exception. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you have to overcome it. And there's all that research. Uh, Dasher Keltner, I think his name is, does up at Berkeley, um, showing how uh, increased wealth actually interferes with your ability to recognize emotions on another person's face. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it's really interesting stuff that happens at very deep levels. He did this one study where he had uh, he he. Um, posted a, an old woman with a walker or a cane or something at a crosswalk, and they set up uh, cameras so they recorded what cars stopped and which cars didn't stop to let her go, right? And the more expensive the car, the less likely it was to stop. Yeah. You know, like, why is that? It's, it's, well, very it reminds me of, of when we lived in Missoula for all that time. Everyone stops there. There are, right. there are exactly zero Aston Martins. That's in a Missoula, good. Montana. That's a good like example of why I really loved Missoula, Montana. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's because everyone stops. It, the, yeah. the one thing yeah. that um, that I didn't like as much about Missoula is there seemed to be a lack of, and maybe we can talk about. Actually, let's let's save this. I want to talk about ambition. There seemed to be a lack of ambition there. I'm going to write this oh, down. Oh, really? Yeah, because we need. Yeah, let's we, talk about that later. Because I feel the exact. I feel like there was too much ambition in Missoula. Oh, no, not at all. But we, we can argue about that. Maybe we'll save that for the maximal. But cool. Christy, I'm going to send you a copy of Civilized to Death. I really hope you enjoy it. Our next question is from Troy in Hartford, Connecticut. Hey, guys, this is Troy from Connecticut. So I'm 22 years old, and I'm trying to start dating again. I found in my first year of adult life that dating isn't as easy as it used to be. In high school and college, I was constantly surrounded by girls, and I would come into all situations where relationships just happen but now those situations are few and far between. I'm not a big fan of dating apps because I want to meet a person organically. I want things to happen naturally. I went up to a cute cashier at a store one time and we had a nice conversation and that conversation ended with me asking for her phone number and her smiling and her writing down her number on a piece of paper. I called that number the next day and found out it was fake and that kind of scarred me. So now I'm scared of asking out a girl that I've just met in person. So I'm wondering, and this is my question, is it weird if I try and ask out a girl in a way that feels natural? Or do I have to kind of conform to the times where it's all dating apps or through Facebook or through interactions that maybe aren't as natural? Well, we do have the author of Sex at Dawn here. Oh, boy. And, and so, um, I mean, there, there are certain dynamics in our culture now that are wildly different from sort of uh, – pre-civilized uh, <laughs> yeah. culture. Uh, but uh, there are some taboos here. But also Troy is uh, wondering about you know, dating apps and, and maybe he wants to do it the more traditional way. But uh, traditional to whom, I guess, would be the question. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I've never been on a dating app, so I have no idea. I'm, I'm aged out of that demographic for sure. Uh, but I, I think that he touches on something that's interesting he wants to meet people organically and when you're in school it's it happens more because you're just around a lot of women um and but the thing is you're also around people who have similar interests right you're taking Mm -hmm. a sociology class you're with people who might be interested in sociology presumably right um so what i would encourage him to do and other young people or or older people looking to meet someone is to put yourself in situations where you're with people who have similar interests. 
So uh, if you like cooking, take some cooking classes. You like dancing, take some dancing classes. Or even if you don't like those things and you want to learn about them, do that. I don't think walking up to a cashier is the way to do this. Yeah. Because she's getting hit on all day long. She doesn't know anything about you. She doesn't know that. All she knows about you is that you think she's cute. Right. Which, hey, everybody thinks she's cute. Right. Mm -hmm. So, And also the other thing I would suggest is if you are in a situation like that where you have a good vibe with someone, I would say give her your number. Yes. And say, give me a call if you're into it. Yeah. Not pushing her to to, to reveal her privacy and take a risk on you if she's not feeling it. Yeah. Well, Ryan? like she has to, I mean, he has to know that she's open to being hit on. And like to, to gauge that from a two minute interaction when her job is to be public facing, I mean, it's really yeah. hard, Troy, for you to like, really know if she i mean she may have a boyfriend you know she may have a she may be married doesn't have a wedding ring on she may be gay right she may be gay so yeah i i, I love the idea of giving the, like giving the cashier her uh, his number um or even an email address or something like that i mean th- that's what's kind of cool about technology is that you don't have to just get someone's phone number there's a million different ways to contact someone that isn't you know so uh, upfront as a phone number because a phone number is kind of personal um but i got to tell you troy if i had a dollar for every fake number i got in my life <laughs> I mean, I'd have a couple dozen bucks. I mean, I'm not going to lie. But here's the thing, Troy, is like, I don't want to discourage him from asking a girl out in public. I do want to discourage him from just asking the cashier out. Yeah. But, you know, if you run into someone at the library or the bookstore and you're hitting it off, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's there's nothing wrong with throwing yourself out there. But, yeah, you can totally do it by giving your number up. But I will say, like, go out and get rejected. I mean, once you get so many rejections from girls, like it becomes easier and easier to actually talk to women. I feel like, I mean, yeah. you know, in a in a respectful way, it's not like you're just going out and like machine gunning. Like, can I get your number? Can I get your number? Can I get your number? Yeah, you're not doing the, the pickup artist thing, right? I met my wife at a grocery store. Yeah. Um, and and you met yours on a dating app. Yeah. And I so there there there's much to recommend. Yeah. Either one of these. Uh, our good friend Matt Diavella, who directed our first documentary, he's working on our, our second one. Less yeah. is now. Um, he met his wife on Tinder. Yeah. And and so like there, it's okay to embrace these. I mean, yeah. you, you say, well, I want the more sort of traditional route, but. Well, traditional okay. ten thousand years ago was you just you know you have an arranged marriage, mm-hmm. or like you know you yeah, that's traditional some, today in some cult yeah, cultures, right? No, that is absolutely true. But I guess like it, there's nothing wrong, Troy, with evolving with the times. And yes, I met Mariah, who is like the best relationship, uh, romantic relationship I've ever been in. I'm so happy to have her in my life, and I owe that to OK Cupid. Their algorithm mm. was like, hey, you and this girl are a ninety three percent match when it comes to personality. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's still right today. Yeah, it, it, abs- it absolutely is. Actually, we're probably more like 95% now because oh, I had some like Christian stuff going on when I filled that out. Pushing it up. Yeah. Nice. But uh, but yeah, like now I've kind of like moved away from that. So we're even closer. But yeah, it was mostly beliefs is where we didn't kind of match on. Uh-huh. But the thing is, is like Colin Wright, uh, he's he's one of our buddies and he, he got... Uh, he got a gig where he had to do um, this He's article right up. Beautiful, beautiful man. <laughs> I'm trying to like not name this company that hired him to write up this article, but basically they were like, "Look, Colin, we want you to go out and try all the dating apps, mm-hmm. and then we want you to write up on our dating app, dating app and explain why what ours has that the others doesn't." So he did that in a very genuine way. He was like, "Look, here's why this dating app is good, and the others don't have this." But he was like, secretly though. Okay, Cupid has the best algorithm. Mm. And that's the only reason why I got on there is from his recommendation. So yeah. Troy, um, I was like you once. I didn't want to get on a dating app. If you were to t- have told me in 1998, like, you know, the year before I graduated high school, hey, Ryan, you're going to meet the love of your life on the internet. I would be like, how freaking desperate am I going to get? Yeah. But now with the with technology evolving, it's it, it can be used as a good tool, especially in the dating world. And the cool thing is, is like, you don't have to go on go on Tinder and just look at it as a meat market. Some people do that, and they're just. Swipe. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, there isn't. But but I know I know my wife used it as that for a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and it's and it's totally okay Sorry, to do Max. that. But I guess to to my, to the point I'm trying to make though is when you go on these dating apps, Troy, which I would recommend that you do. Be a hundred percent genuine. If you want to go on there as a meat market, you know, app, then great. Use it as that. Be upfront about that. If you want to go on there and meet a you know long term romantic partner, then be upfront about that too. I mean, there are still you know ways to find genuine people online, even though there might be a little bit of a, a little bit of a cesspool on there. But uh, but it's totally possible if you're being yourself. Um, Matt Tivell is a great example where. You know, he was on Tinder. Tinder was kind of looked at as the hookup app. Mm-hmm. He met his wife on there, 
but they were both very upfront about like, hey, yeah, like, you know, sure, we're dating, but I'm really looking for a long-term partner. They had a lot in common, and now they're married. I think it's really important to um, – something I didn't appreciate until I was well into my 30s is how important it is to filter out incompatible people early yeah. so you don't waste time. The fact that a woman's hot doesn't mean that you're going to be a good match with her, <laughs> right. right? So it might be a good match for about two minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not going to be a fulfilling relationship. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so if if what you're interested in is a relationship, stop thinking about women in terms of physical attractiveness so much and go deeper than that and yeah. and pursue relationships with people with whom you have common interests, like that you would actually want to share your life with. Yeah. And that's totally independent of what someone looks like. I couldn't agree more, man. When I went on OkCupid, I told myself like I wasn't going to judge a book by its cover and mariah when she reached out to me she had nothing on her profile no not picture even a photo. not even a photo nothing so you just lucked out and i lucked out yeah hot. that's right Dude. but she was not she was not the first she was not the first girl who had messaged me with no right. uh, profile picture right. but i mean just to your point i got so much more out of that dating app because i wasn't going for mm. just looks um yeah i mean i really went out of my way to kind of you know date whoever we, when we had the high percentage, you know, 80, 90% range, I was right. like, I'm going to give this a shot no matter how right. they look. And you're probably going to learn something interesting from the person, enjoy their company, right? Even yeah. if there's not the chemical attraction, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think we can use our time so much better if we just sort of filter out. And getting to your point about rejection, like I've spent most of my adult life living in Spain, right? And the Spanish approach to dating and courtship is quite different from mm -hmm. the American approach. In that, uh, you know, the sort of Spanish, Italian men, their vibe is that rejection is expected. Oh, that's wow. part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like this game. Almost, yeah, it's like, like a game. It's yeah. no big deal. And, and so they'll say something, you know, to a woman like, you know, oh my God, you're so beautiful. You would never go out with a guy like me, would you? Mm -hmm. You know, like, and sh and she might laugh and say, well, no, or may maybe I don't know. Maybe I'd make an exception, or whatever. But it's like re reject. Re we're calling it rejection, but it isn't really because, as you said, there are a million reasons that she might not be available, right? That have nothing to do with you. Yeah, and so American guys tend to take this stuff so personally, right? Mm -hmm. um, which puts a lot of pressure on her right. because now she's feeling like, oh my god, this guy's so fragile. If I say no, it's going to ruin his day, you know. Whereas if you're just like, hey, I'm confident, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'd love to have dinner with you, but yeah, I understand it's probably not going to happen. But I just thought I'd ask. Yeah. That's much easier for her to say yes, actually. Yeah, right, because yeah. you're not putting this heavy sale on her. Yeah, Troy, Absolutely. I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that we've ever written. Here, I'll hold it up for the YouTube audience. But also, my favorite chapter in there is about a relationship that I really screwed up and the lessons I learned from that relationship. The first uh, quote, "Love of my life," if we can call it that. Um, and I was actually my, it was, I was after my marriage and, uh, so I was, I was divorced at this point, but I was dating someone and, uh, really loved her, but also forsook her in several ways. And there was a compatibility there that I didn't acknowledge. Mm. And so a lot of lessons learned throughout that. Also, Troy, I'm going to recommend you get, uh, Chris brought up know your interests. So you, you, you can be compatible with someone with similar interests. Also know your values. A lot of us aren't clear on what our values are, and you can find someone with similar values. If you want to get clear on your values, we just have a new essay on our website right now. It's called How to Understand Your Values. There's a free worksheet on there, so you can like you can download it and print it out and fill out what your values are. You can see what mine are. My, my wife and I, we go over this once a year and just sort of talk about what are your values. It helps me better, better understand her so I can understand how to interact with her. It also helps me better understand myself so I can figure out how to interact with other people. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes, but you can also find it at theminimalists.com slash V as that, in values. That just totally speaks to you and Bex's like, a-type personality. I don't know where it would be on the Myers-Briggs, but you're like, 
All right, honey. Today is uh, the planning. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. The, today is January first. Um, do you have your values worksheet? <laughs> um, I'd I'd like to sit down and compare our. And Bex is like, yes, honey, I do have my values worksheet. We grade it. It's great. <laughs> oh, is it nine fifteen? Oh, yeah. oh, we're Good. we're late. We're late. <laughs> Did you not check the calendar, <laughs> <laughs> sweetheart? <laughs> All right, enjoy that, Troy. Uh, values worksheet, theminimalists.com slash values. We'll send you a copy of everything that remains as well. If you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of that. Or if you want the book book or the ebook, we'll send those to you as well. Ryan, what time is it? You ready? Are you ready for the lightning round? We got to hurry. Quick, quick, quick. All right, man. This is where we answer questions from social media. Indeed, we do. We're at The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And Chris Ryan is at that Chris Ryan. You can follow him as well. And uh, what we try to do here, Chris, is we try to answer questions with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. Oh, boy. But not really. We ramble a little bit. Yeah. And then Sean tweezes something out, makes it beautiful and pithy. Oh. And he puts it in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if they'd like. <laughs> And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place, uh, minimalmaxims.com. Ryan, what's our question? All right. April wants to know, how much sacrifice is too much sacrifice? Ooh, I used to, I used to hate this word um, because it had this sort of negative con- connotation. But I think of it now as, I don't know, is there a difference between compromise and sacrifice? Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. I, oh, go ahead. I, I, I think people who say relationships are a lot of work might be in the wrong relationship. Woo! Really? Yeah. That podcast, Man. Sean. But you know, what's, you know what, though? I, There's some pith for you. <laughs> my my relationship is a lot of work, but that's because of me. <laughs> a lot of work from like, Mariah. Yeah, so whether yeah. Mariah was with me or not, I'm constantly working uh, on myself. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I think relationships certainly are uh, like the, the, the golden road to maturation and growth if you're in a good one mm-hmm. because your partner, you know, challenges your bullshit and you know, questions you on things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, ultimately, I think these things should be pleasurable, should be enjoyable. Yeah. You're growing together. You're living together. You know, people who fight about every little thing, like, yeah, move on. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, that's, that's a toxic relationship. and. Yeah. I got to tell you, like, there's so many relationships I stayed in where we were arguing about so many little things. Uh, and it was for the wrong reasons. She was really good looking. Or the worst was, like, I loved her family. Yeah. But I did not love her. So I, oh, yeah. I stayed around for the family. But, yeah, we find these reasons to stay in these relationships. We're arguing about every little thing. And, I mean, moving on from those relationships, it was tough. But hindsight, it's one of the best things I could have done for myself. I think that there are three components to relationships. There's uh, sexual chemistry. Mm -hmm. There's compatibility. And there's love. Yeah. And when I was younger, I used to think love was really rare. And now that I'm older, I see love is everywhere. So love plentiful. is the easiest. Yeah. Because you're going to love everyone. And, yeah. and chemistry is is plentiful as well. That's the reason mm-hmm. there are 8 billion people on this earth is we found a lot of chemistry. <laughs> Yeah, but compatibility is rough. It's, and, and it's rarer. And, and, and it's the yeah. values thing we talked yeah. about, the interests. It, yeah. They all have to align in a way. And by the way, you need to be in, in sort of a similar space as well. So like your, value, your values might shift over time. Your interests certainly will shift over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Find your uh, one th- piece of advice I keep coming back to in these areas is find your non-negotiables and then don't negotiate. Right. Right? So yeah. if you really want to have kids... Don't settle down with someone who doesn't want to have kids because right. someone's going to be miserable. If you're non-monogamous and you know that about yourself, don't get into a monogamous relationship. Yeah. You're going to end up hurting yourself and the other person. It's misleading. It's 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 false. Yeah. yeah. To thine own self be true. Mm. You know that line from uh, Hamlet, I think it is. Yeah. And it follows as night follows the day. Thou canst not be false to any man, right? Mm. If you If you're true to yourself, you won't lie to anyone else Amen. that's a beautiful way to put it my pithy answer real quick is enough is in the eye of the beholder yeah and so sometimes I, we we don't even stop to ask what enough is and so when when april asks well how much sacrifice is too much sacrifice i mean i think it's highly sper- perspectival with respect to your situation and whether we're talking about a relationship or with stuff or you're sacrificing maybe to w- work a job to feed your family there's a certain amount of sacrifice that might be well that might be appropriate for you that would be totally inappropriate for me yeah uh, my pithy answer is there's no such thing as the perfect amount of anything and i think we look especially um going down this road of minimalism people will ask us like oh what's the perfect amount of things to own mm-hmm. what's the perfect amount of things to give up 
And, and we got to stop aiming for perfect and we have to start looking for balance. So if you're sacrificing and you're finding yourself in a black hole of depression and of deprivation, then maybe, yeah, stop sacrificing a little too much. If you're finding yourself in a world of 100% pleasure to the point where your level for pleasure has been uh, raised and you are uh, you know, on that hedonic treadmill, um, then maybe, yeah, maybe sacrifice a few things to to uh, appreciate the things that you do have. It makes me think of, uh, have you heard about this thing that they're doing in Silicon Valley now, the um, dopamine fasts? Have you heard about this? No. So like basically, it's this trend happening right now where uh, you basically rob yourself of any joy or anything that would give you dopamine. <laughs> I don't know what the time limit this is. This sounds very puritanical. Right, yeah. yeah, it's really, well, what's well, what's crazy though is it speaks to how the balance is important. Right, Because right. like what, it, it, the pendulum has swung because it's it's been hedonism and so I'm gonna give up. Who, uh, uh, God, we gotta get, introduce you to uh, Pete Rollins. You guys would fall in love with each other, uh, platonically. <laughs> um, but the, the, or other, you know, no judgment. The thing he talks about is like he goes, he's a, he's a he's a former like pastor, but he uh, uh, he's like a, a religious heretic in, in, in a way. Um, but the thing he talks about is he knows like christian conservatives who really want to be hippies and he knows hippies who want to be christian conservatives because mm -hmm. it, it becomes this this pendulum and we feel as though well hedonism didn't work for me so now i'm gonna have to never have dopamine in my life ever again or for this pe right. period of time yeah. all right before we get into our added value segment and our listener tips today it looks like we have a bunch more to talk about this week. Ryan, we got so much more to talk about. First, we're going to argue about ambition. We'll have yes. Dr. Ryan uh, mediate that. I hate uh, when I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when you're wrong, I hate, too. I hate when I'm wrong and right. <laughs> we're going to talk about Matt Diavella and his story of the, of the unfortunate events that happened at a massage parlor. Yeah. Man, and I had something very similar happen. I, You know what? I can't talk about it in public. We'll save it for the Patreon episode. Yep. We're also going to talk about... Is intelligent sexy or what makes someone sexy? You know, Chris is the author of Sex at Dawn, so we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that. We're going to talk about why my wife thinks Chris Ryan is sexy. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about um, why do humans form hierarchical societies and why are we so power hungry? We're going to talk about civilization. We're going to talk about schizophrenia and how some people around the world actually hear good voices when they're schizophrenic. Yeah. I, I find that to be really fascinating. We're going to talk about love and compatibility. We're going to talk about how Christopher Columbus was a total psychopath and why he was a psychopath. We're going to talk about, man, well, so many other things. Vaccines, vaccinating our kids. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, and find out the four things you need to know about vaccines in this week's Patreon episode. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, Chris Ryan is really going to take on uh, Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker in a way that I've never heard anyone take them on before he does such a, a great job and so so much more one of the best conversations i've ever had uh with dr christopher ryan so if you want to hear all that you i love can. i love how we can just like record random conversations and make something out of it because yeah. i feel like the conversation we had uh -huh. like that's if we were at dinner we would just be having that conversation absolutely yeah yeah so really cool. if you want to hear all that you can listen to this week's maximal episode available exclusively on patreon i'm not going to go through the whole spiel this week uh, just know that if you do become a patron then you can play our podcast episodes our private podcast episodes in your regular podcast app it's just two bucks if you really want to help us out keep yeah. us 100 percent advertisement free and listen to this week's conversation with Dr. Christopher Ryan. Probably the best conversation you're going to hear all month. It's the best conversation yeah. I've had. It was a great, great combo. Yes, indeed. You so can, should you, we should we tell them that if they become a, pa a Patreon uh, subscriber, that they could be they could live a complete life and have happiness mm -hmm. at their grips. Well, and have all the pleasure they want. <laughs> 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 all right, y'all. Uh, if you do want to listen to that and all of our. 100 plus private podcast episodes you can do so over at theminimalists.com slash support ryan what else you got for us this week i got some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners check them out hey joshua and ryan this is adam from massachusetts thank you both so much for all that you do to help simplify and add value to people's lives i have a few digital tools that have helped me reduce the traffic of messages and lists we so often lose or perhaps mismanage on a daily basis the first is Google Keep, which is a sticky note application 
to help you add dates and times to remind you of upcoming tasks that may not warrant a calendar invite, such as dropping off a letter or even making grocery lists. The notes can be archived when they're done, so it's less of an inbox look to it, although the archives can be searched at a later time if need be. The second tool is called unroll.me, which is an email service for most common email providers, and it shows you every list to which your email is currently associated. Once you give the service permission to access your email, I've used this service for years, by the way, and I've had no negative experiences with it, and it's free. You can unsubscribe from any and all lists there on this single site, or you can choose to keep them in your inbox. And lastly, you can quote, roll them up into a single daily email from the unroll.me service. Perhaps coolest of all is that it shows you when you're added to new email lists so that it's a sustainable resource to add to your life. The last tool is more of a shift in behavior with respect to digital activity. So recently I removed all non-value adding applications and push notifications from my phone and I began doing all of my major work assignments first thing in the morning at work as opposed to checking emails. Both of these behavior switches have added tremendous time to my life for valuable activities and output in both professional and personal capacities. Hey, uh, guys. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks and give you guys encouragement. I'm from Montana, so it's fun to hear Montana in a positive light, and I appreciate the reader stories and everything you guys do to make the podcast go well, but uh, my wife and I discovered this awesome game during our purging. Uh, we ended up with a pile of negotiable items. I call it the minimalist roulette or cage match or minimalist cage match. Basically, my Velvet Elvis painting versus my wife's Striper vinyl album uh, or things of that nature. Uh, we can then both make a case for why we want to keep that item and it helps us talk through the value process. Does it provide a value-added service or a value-added memory or et cetera? Would I defend this item in family court? It's a fun, low-pressure way to process what to keep and what to let go of. And it really helps each other ask each other questions and bring out, you know, why should I keep this? And we actually uh, did this with our dog's toys as well. We kind of left the toys out to see which ones you were interested in. And we uh, actually got our dog in on the minimalism, and uh, she is also a fan. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Dr. Christopher Ryan for joining us this week. I encourage you to check out his new book, Civilized to Death, and check out his podcast, which I absolutely enjoy all the time. It is called Tangentially Speaking. You can also find him on Twitter at that Chris Ryan. And real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. We uh, talked about this earlier, but I just wanted to reiterate it. Get your values worksheet. Know what your values are over at theminimalists.com slash V. There's an essay there called How to Understand Your Values. And I list what all my current values are, how they've changed over the years, explain the whole process. And you can download, it's a printable worksheet so you can fill out your own values. If you like, you can review them with other people. And uh, I think you'll find a lot of value in it. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839. Oh, by the way, that's uh, theminimalists.com slash V for that values workshop. Oh, or you can send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com if you have a question, comment, or tip. You can comment on this episode, though, over at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. We'll never, ever, ever, ever send you spam or junk or sell your email address to the Taliban. Maybe we should have like a, a spam giveaway. <laughs> that's only for our patreon supporters oh okay <laughs> send them spam <laughs> all right uh oh but we will send you our simple sunday newsletter if you want to get writings from the minimalists for our added value this week i wanted to go back ryan way 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 back jesus to, to man. 2012 yeah all the way back then before uh before we were so civilized <laughs> Uh, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, uh, Macklemore's first album or their first album together. The, the best anti-consumerism song I think I've ever heard is a song called Wings mm -hmm. by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. It's uh, from their album, The Heist. And so I would encourage you to check that out. It is the perfect... Uh, 
it's the perfect explanation of how we have civilized ourselves to death. Yeah. And, and we, we're not complete unless I buy this thing and I have this emblem, I have this logo on my shoe or my body. I'm not going to be complete. And it's a song about that. I would encourage you to check that out. It's called Wings on the Heist album. And if you leave here today with one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.